Hey, well, good morning, church, and welcome to Sunday. We made it another week. Uh, we are back for week four of our series on anxiety, and this is going to be the final week. So if you find um, that you're a person that really doesn't struggle that much with anxiety or you really don't have issues coping uh, with your anxiety, uh, and this series really hasn't been for you, this is our last week on anxiety. But this, I think, is a week that's Something that we all struggle with, whether anxiety profoundly and deeply impacts you or, or it doesn't. I think what we're going to talk about today is something that we all struggle with. I'm confident saying that we all deal with this from time to time. And if I was to title this anything, I would say um, anxiety, what to do when you just can't decide. And that is anxiety related to our decision making. And we, we've all struggled with making decisions. What do I do? I don't know what to do. How do I decide? And it causes us a significant amount of anxiety. And our driving verse for, for this series, for these four weeks, has been Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, that is Philippians. And in chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, Paul says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness to be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And you know, we often wonder how, like, how can you have peace in trials? We've all had trials. We've all been through things. And it's like, how? How am I supposed to have peace? peace in this? How is that possible? And, and remember, understanding what Paul is going through while he is writing this brings that much more power to the text itself. I mean, Paul, who, who desired to go to Rome, who wanted to go to Rome and minister to the church at Rome, wanted to go there as a preacher, and he finds himself on his way to Rome as a prisoner. He's awaiting trial. He's not sure What's going to happen with him? His life is probably going to end. And, and he pens that. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Do not be anxious about anything. Like, come on, Paul. How can you tell me, Paul, that you are not anxious about your current circumstances? Like, how can you say you have no anxiety given what you're going through? I mean, how, how can we say that we, we don't deal with anxiety given what our world is going through right now, what we personally are going through? How, how is it that we can have peace and remain at peace during times when we're dealing with this pandemic and this virus that no one really understands or knows anything about? You know, and, and social distancing and social isolation. And we've been dealing with that for months now. We were not created to be socially distant or isolated. We were created as, as social people. We need relationship. And then to make matters worse, a couple weeks ago, we get massive amounts of rain and there is flooding everywhere. And then a couple dams fail and, and increase the flooding and the pain and the suffering. And some people don't have homes. They lost their cars. Their boat ended up miles away. And it's like in the middle of all this pandemic and this uncertainty and my anxiety is already heightened. Now this happens. And then a week ago, a, a black man, an African-American man dies because of a cop who took it too far and did something he shouldn't have done while others just sat around and watched. And yeah, he was arrested and he's being charged with murder as he should be. But there's so much unrest right now in our country. And I feel for that man and I feel for his family. His life was taken and it shouldn't have been. And now people are protesting and that's fine. And then, but the protesting gets gets torn off in this weird tangent and turns into rioting and looting. And there's so much going on in our world right now. It's causing so much anxiety. How can we have peace of mind 
my mind is racing and overwhelmed and, and things are uncertain and I feel this pressure and this fear. And you know, I think with all of that happening, one of the biggest forms of anxiety for us, and in fact, maybe not the biggest, but a big form of our anxiety, a source of our stress, something that everybody deals with, period, is anxiety related to our decision making. How do we make decisions, especially when if we make a bad decision, the consequences are irreversible. It's not like we can just turn back time on our decisions and do things differently. What do we do when you just can't decide? The weight of the decision is so heavy on you, you don't want to decide. Listen, making decisions can be incredibly stressful and lead to a lot of anxiety. It's like, what do I do? I don't know what to do. And, and if I decide this is what I'm going to do, how do I do it? When do I do it? What exactly does God want me to do? What is the will of God in this circumstance? You know, I, I am dealing with the stress of, of college and which college to go to. Do I go to college? Do I go to trade school? I'm unsure. Or, you know, buying a house. I want to buy a house, but it's a lot of money. I don't want to rent anymore because I feel like I'm throwing the money away. But at the same time, buying a house is stressful. And then when I decide I want to buy a house, which house do I buy? I don't want to buy the wrong house. You know, so I don't know what to do, and then there's dating, and there's marriage, and there's just so much. It is so complicated and stressful, and it causes an immense amount of anxiety. You know, some of the most anxious moments in my life, outside of like basic training, boot camp, and, and just becoming an adult in general, was when Chloe was in the hospital. It's like she has cancer. We got to figure out what we're going to do for surgery. And then when the surgery's done, now we got to figure out what kind of treatment we're going to give her and what type of radiation therapy. Because there's like a million different types. Oh, well, we can't really do radiation because she's too young. So it's going to have to be chemo. There's a million and a half different drugs that might work for this. Where do we go? Which hospital do we stay at? Walter Reed. Do we go to Children's? Do we go somewhere else? We don't know what to do. And it's like every one of these decisions is weighing on me because if I make the wrong decision, it could mean her life. And if I wait too long to decide, then it gets worse because the cancer's still growing. What do we do? And it causes a lot of anxiety. And it's that way for all of us. In fact, we live in an age of anxiety, I think, now more than ever. Why is it so complicated to make decisions? I mean, I think, first of all, we have too many choices. It's this like paradox of choices. There are way too many things that we can choose to do. Take, for example, I mean, we can talk about anything in the number of choices we have now. But let's talk, for example, about cars, right? Just in, in from 2000 to 2018, let's say I decide I want to buy a new car. In 2000, there were 211, 211 different automobile models that I could purchase new in 2000. Jump ahead to 2018, and in 2018, there were 293 automobile models. It's like there's way too many choices. Like, how do I decide when I have so many choices? And the decision is final and it's permanent and I have to deal with it. You know, I read a couple articles online that actually suggest, and most of the research tends to agree, that kids, children, in a given day, make approximately 3,000 decisions. And adults don't have it much better. In fact, adults have it significantly worse, five times worse. Adults, in a given day, make around 35,000 individual decisions. You know, no wonder we have anxiety. And, and, you know, some of the stuff are easy decisions. You know, what am I going to eat for breakfast? You know, well, that's, you know, whatever I feel like eating for breakfast. That's what I'm going to eat for breakfast. That's an easy decision. You know, uh, what kind of clothes am I going to wear? That's a relatively easy decision that causes low anxiety or low stress, but there are a lot of hard 
decisions. I mean, look at look at the graduating class this year of 2020. They're trying to prepare, and even the juniors that are graduating next year, they're trying to prepare for their future and trying to think about college and what kind of career do I want. College alone, let's just say I'm looking for a brick and mortar building. I don't want to do online, but a brick and mortar building in the state of Michigan, there's 93 different colleges in the state of Michigan. And maybe I'm okay with going online. Well, there's 4,700, 4,700 accredited universities online. Which one do I pick? I don't want to bounce from college to college, semester to semester. And if I make the wrong decision, now I'm stuck at this college. I, I, how can we make it? And to make matters worse, in the U.S., there's over 629 public universities, and over 1,800, 1,800 private universities. That's almost 2,450 options for me to go to school. Like, no wonder we're getting stressed about making decisions. And adults, we, we're the same. Like, College is not our decision. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But typically, we're dealing with things like work. What do I do at work when my coworkers aren't getting along? My boss doesn't like me. Or I found out that that coworker did something wrong. Should I turn him in? Shouldn't I turn him in? We're dealing with our kids, making decisions for our kids and our kids' lives that will affect their life for years to come. We're making decisions on our marriage. It could affect the rest of my life. It could affect my marriage, about our friends, about our family. There's just so many choices. And I think we're afraid, right? The other issue is we're afraid of making a costly mistake. I mean, I might be missing out on the will of God if I choose wrongly. So what does God want me to do? It's like if I can find that one right answer, and I can make that decision wisely, then I can pursue my purpose and I can live in God's will. But what if I miss it? What if I miss it? What if I make the wrong decision and now I feel like I'm missing out on God's will for my life and I don't know my purpose and I don't know what God wants me to do. And you know, I'm not sure, so I hesitate. I'm not going to make a decision. I freeze and I don't do anything. Have you been there? Because I have. I don't do anything. I don't make a decision. And an indecision in itself is a decision. It's so complicated. It's like that, that Rush song, Free Will. There's a line in that song where they say, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. Indecision is decision. It is so complicated. No wonder it causes us so much anxiety. But here's the thing. Don't complicate it. One simple thought for you guys, okay? And this is coming out of Acts 15. And this is where I'm going to focus today. Acts 15. This is the Jerusalem Council, okay? So the church, Jesus is gone. He has been resurrected. The church is establishing itself. It is growing exponentially by the day. And the Jerusalem Council gets together because Paul's ministry was primarily to the Gentiles. And James and Peter and a lot of the other uh, apostles are ministering to the Jews. And there's this conflict. They're having issues with you know, things like eating meat sacrificed to animals or do I need to be circumcised? Don't I need to be circumcised in order to be saved? And Paul and Barnabas go to Jerusalem and they sit down with James and they sit down with Peter and the church leaders to try and figure these things out. And I'm reading from you from the English Standard Version, the ESV Version. Normally I read from the NIV, the New International Version. I think the NIV reads really easy. It stays very true to the point. But I like the ESV version. That's the version I typically study out of. And so I'm reading from the ESV today, Acts 15. And let's look at verse 22. Now remember, the church is meeting to try and make decisions. And these are big decisions that are going to affect the church for years to come. If we make the wrong decision, then the church could split 
right out of the gate. Jesus is gone. We're months, maybe a year or two in, and the church is going to split because we made a wrong decision. Like, that's not good. But but if we if we make the right decision, it could profoundly impact the church and things could increase and the church will increase and we will prosper. So they're making these heavy, heavy, important decisions. And Acts 15, 22 says this, it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And then Acts 15, 25 says, it seemed good to us having come to one accord to choose men and send them with you, our beloved Paul and Barnabas. And Acts 15, 28 says, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. Listen, it seemed good to them. So so they're saying do what seems right. Do what feels right. That's what it did, all three verses. They're making these important decisions. And it's saying, it seems good to us to do this. Just do what seems right. Do what feels good. But then how do you reconcile that with Proverbs 14? Because Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. So what are we supposed to do? Because Proverbs says that if I do what seems right to me, it ends in death. But the early church did what seemed right to them. So, so what do we do? Listen, let me tell you this. If you are around the wrong people or you are listening to the wrong voice, living for the wrong values, then doing what seems right to you will oftentimes be wrong. It's like uh, when I was in high school, I took this metal shop class, right? And I was in the new high school, the current high school, and the metal shop class was in the building on the far east of campus by the ball diamonds. And, and it's now, I think it was the, the maintenance garage for a while, and now they're turning it into a new tech lab. But anyway, we had to walk from high school, from the high school, I don't know, five, six hundred yards over to the metal shop class every day and it became annoying and strenuous. It wasn't bad in spring and fall, but in the late June and early months back in, in the end of August, when it was 100 degrees, you did not want to walk because it was hot. By the time you got there, you were sweating. It was just nasty. And from December through you know April, you get a morning where it's 28 degrees, maybe 10 degrees, or even zero degrees. You did not want to make that walk. It was cold. It was nasty. There was snow. So a lot of people would get in their cars, walk out to the parking lot, get in the car, drive to shop class. And now that seems innocent enough, but they didn't want us doing that. We were told we weren't allowed to do that. And you know what? I still did it anyway, until I got caught. And the principal brought me into the office and he said, Joe, what are you doing? Like, I know you. I know you're the type of person that's going to listen, that's going to follow the rules. You're not a rule breaker. So why are you doing it? You know, well, I'm doing it because I'm lazy and I don't want to deal with the weather. And it's a lot easier for me to walk 50 feet out of the building to get my car and drive over there and then drive back and it saves time. And he told me, you're hanging out with the wrong people. They're influencing you in a negative way. It's just like with mom and dad. Like there were certain people that, that I was friends with, but mom and dad said, I don't want you hanging out with them. They're a bad influence. And as much as I would argue, yeah, but I'm a good influence on them. Ain't wrong. No, that's not how it works. We've all experienced that. We've all thought that before. Like, yep, I'm going to be a good influence on them. Well, that, no. The bad influence always seems to outweigh or outvoice the good. And now I find my daughter telling her the same thing. And my son, I don't want you hanging out with them. They can come here and hang out, but I don't want you going to them and hanging out with them because they're a bad influence. So how could Paul and James 
and Barnabas and the other church leaders be comfortable making these decisions, these heavy decisions about doctrine, about the direction the church was going in, about eternal destiny, and saying it just seems right. Remember, Acts 15, 22, it seemed right to the apostles and the elders, with the whole church, in fact, to choose men. Acts 15, 25, it seemed good to us, having come to one accord. In Acts 15, 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. See, the big difference here is what seems right to a man leads to death, but a group of faith-filled, devil-kicking, mountain-moving disciples of Jesus, when they get on the same page and come to one accord, in that moment, you can do what seems right and trust that it's right. Because these guys are in there, they are searching God's word, they are seeking God's heart, and they are listening to God's voice. With the whole church, one voice, unified in one accord. That is the church. When we are in fellowship, when we are in agreement, when we are in one spirit, we can do what seems right, and it's right. And we will be unstoppable. Listen, don't complicate it. Don't complicate your anxiety. We need to remember that that with our anxiety, if it's something that's big enough to worry about, that it's big enough to pray about, and the reality is anxiety is just a signal, like the check engine light in our car. Our anxiety is a signal alerting us that it's time to pray, and we don't always feel like we are in control, and, and oftentimes we feel like if we can control our circumstances, then we'll have less anxiety. We don't have always the power to control, but we always have the power to surrender to God because of who God is. We can have a perspective of praise and we can rejoice in God, even in our pain, not because of what we're going through, but because of who God is. I mean, in a nutshell, if we're going to recap Philippians 4, 4 through 7, we can say that with a posture of prayer and a per, uh, perspective, with a posture of prayer and a perspective of praise, seeking the will of God, we can do what seems right. When we have a posture of prayer and our perspective is one of praise and we seek God and God's will, we can do what seems right. And we can trust that it'll be right. Listen, our decision making, I feel like, is sometimes similar to the GPS in your car, right? And, and I know a lot of people don't have GPS anymore because we have smartphones and I don't need that big clunky thing in my car. I'll just use my phone. But it, it's like using GPS to get you somewhere whether it's on your phone or with the GPS. And it's like I'm driving and the GPS tells me I need to take the next right. And I'm thinking to myself, that doesn't seem right. Like I remember doing this once before and I'm pretty sure it's the next right. Not this right, but it's the next right. And then my wife says, no, well, it's this right. You need to take this right. But that doesn't seem right to me. I think I need to take the next one. And the exit's in like 100 yards. And I'm two lanes over. And I can't make it. So I'm not going to take the exit. I'm going to do what seems right to me. And I'm going to take the next exit. And it's like as soon as I pass by that exit, I realize I was wrong. That was the wrong decision. I should have taken this exit. I messed up. I made a huge mistake. And now I'm going to miss out. See, but Paul wrote to the church in Rome and said in Romans 8, 28, that we know, and we know because we've all experienced before, in one way or another, when Paul says, and we know, it's because we have been there. He says, and we know that in all Things, not some things, not good things, not bad things, but in all things. And we know in all things, God 
works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And catch that verb. God works. That's present tense. He is working. He is active in every aspect of our life. It does not say that God worked for the good. It does not say that God will work as if there's something we need to do. It says God works. He is actively working for the good for you and for me. And if we make a a wrong turn, guess what? If you make a wrong decision, God is still working. It's not like he disappears. Paul's in prison and it's like, what happened to me? And Paul doesn't give up because God disappears. He says, you know what? No, I am here to advance the gospel. When you make a wrong turn, what does your GPS do? It says rerouting. It doesn't shut off and say, you didn't follow my direction, we're done, you're you're lost, you're never going to make it. The GPS says rerouting. Listen, one wrong turn, one incorrect decision is not going to keep you from arriving at your desired destination. It simply puts you on a different path. Listen, God has a way of bringing all things together to the good, and working out wrong turns. Even when I make a mistake, God can bring it to good. He can bring me to the place he wanted me, even in my error. You know, it's like I I shouldn't have dated him. Well, you know what? That's going to help you to appreciate your godly guy when you get him. You know, I shouldn't have trusted that person. Well, this gives you the ability to grow in your ability to forgive or, you know, I shouldn't have been so stupid. What was I thinking? Well, now you get a chance to experience the grace of God. Listen, don't complicate your decisions. Don't complicate anxiety. With a posture of prayer and a perspective of of praise, we will seek God and do what seems right. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of of God, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do not be anxious for nothing, but in all circumstances, with prayer and petition, give your thanks, give, with thanksgiving, give your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. Pray with me. God, I just thank you so much for this day. Lord, as much as we're over this social isolation, we don't understand why it's continuing. God, the anxiety from it is built up to a boiling point where it's going to overflow. We don't know what to do. God, I pray you would be with us in our decision making. Be with us as we navigate these waters of life. God, be with us in the good times when we know you're there. And be with us in the in the valleys when we're brought low and we can't feel your presence, Lord. Make your presence known to us. Be with us. Give us the right mind so that we can do what seems right and trust you for the rest. Lord, be with us as we're a church that that begins to navigate the waters of opening back up. I pray that, that you would take this virus and just get rid of it. Um, remove it from us. I pray that you would allow us to meet together and be one unified body together. God, physically together, not just spiritually together. I pray that you would be with us. Those who have lost because of this flood, help us to have the right perspective, a perspective of praise for who you are. Be with us, God, as people struggle with the senseless loss of a man. And there are protesting, God, and, and, and justified so. And there are riots, God. Just please be with us. Keep people safe. Protect us. Protect their livelihood. Give them your peace. Let us use these bad circumstances 
as a tool to advance your gospel. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks a lot, guys, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Have a wonderful week.